are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio. Blackstone Audio presents The Story of Christianity, Volume 1, Revised and Updated. The Early Church to the Reformation. This book is read by Michael Kramer. A gentle answer with a powerful point. Here is the parable of the Good Samaritan. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 35. Again, the fact that Jesus continued to answer this man was in itself an act of grace. The man's attempt to show Jesus up was obnoxious. Religious leaders tried this many times with Jesus and always failed. His ability to answer well all their hard questions only infuriated them. But try as they might, they could not provoke him. On this occasion in particular, Jesus' reply stands out for its warm-hearted, gracious, loving restraint. The man was deliberately trying to goad Jesus, begging for a sharp answer that he planned to pursue with a heated debate. But sometimes a gentle tongue breaks a bone. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 15. And that's what happens here. Jesus is not telling this account as if it were a true story. It's a parable, a tale spun to dramatize in an unforgettable way the point he wanted to drive into this legalist's heart, and ours as well. As in most of Jesus' stories and parables, he has one simple point to make. There are lots of details in this story, and plenty of secondary implications. But what's important here is the central lesson, and that is what we need to focus on. The Dangerous Road and the Attack The story begins with a journey on a very dangerous road. It is the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Luke chapter 10, verse 30. The road is real. I've traveled on that very road. Visitors to Israel can still take the same route used by travelers in Jesus' time. From Jerusalem to Jericho is about a 4,000-foot drop in elevation across 17 miles of winding road, crossing barren mountains over very rough terrain. In places, a steep 300-foot precipice, rather than any kind of shoulder, borders the road. Much of the route is lined with caves and massive boulders, which offer hideouts for robbers. It is still a dangerous road. In Jesus' story, the predictable happens. A man traveling alone on the road was jumped by a band of thieves, particularly brutal ones. They didn't just rob him, they stripped him almost naked. They didn't just take his purse with his cash, they took everything he had. Then they brutally beat him and left him for dead. We would say today he was in critical condition, a dying man on a desert road. That road saw a steady stream of travelers when people were coming and going from Jerusalem for the feasts. But in other seasons, especially during the peak heat of summer or the stifling windy season and cold of winter, Traffic on the road could be meager. There were no homes and very few stopping points on that stretch of road. It was not a friendly place, especially for someone alone and desperate. It might be a very long time before help came along, if ever. 
there was no guarantee anyone would find him or help him. The Priest and the Levite At this dramatic point in the story, Jesus introduces a bit of hope. By chance, a certain priest came down that road. Luke chapter 10, verse 31. This appears on the surface to be the best of news. Here comes a servant of God, one who offers sacrifices for people in the temple, a spiritual man who should be a paragon of compassion. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 2. He represents the best of men. A priest of all people would be familiar with the Mosaic law. He would know Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18 says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He ought to know as well that verses 33 and 34 in that same chapter expound on the principle of neighborly love by applying it to strangers in particular. If a stranger dwells with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him. The stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself. A priest would know Micah chapter 6, verse 8. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. He would be fully aware that whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 13. The principle spelled out in James chapter 2, verse 13, was woven into the Old Testament as well. Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. The priest was surely familiar with Exodus chapter 23, verses 4 through 5. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden, and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. So if a person found his enemy's donkey in a ditch, he was obliged to rescue the donkey, right? Of course he had a greater duty to help a man in critical condition. But that flash of hope was short-lived. When the priest saw the injured man, he passed by on the other side. Luke chapter 10, verse 31. The Greek text uses a verb found nowhere in Scripture other than in that verse and the one that follows, antiparerkamai. The antiprefix, of course, means opposite. It's an active verb signifying that the priest deliberately relocated to the opposite side of the road. He went out of his way to avoid the injured traveler, purposely shunning the man in need. The priest obviously had no compassion for people in dire distress. No other conclusion can be drawn from this. Jesus turned the lawyer's question on its head. The question the fellow asked was, Who is my neighbor? But that's not the right question. Jesus is showing him through this parable that righteous compassion is not narrow. It is not seeking for definitions of what sufferers are qualified to deserve help. The duties of the second great commandment are not defined by the question of who our neighbor is. In fact, the converse is true. Genuine love compels us to be neighborly, even to strangers and aliens. The full meaning of the second great commandment includes the principle Jesus made emphatic in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. We should love even our enemies. They are our neighbors, too and therefore we are obliged to bless them, do good to them, and pray for them. The cold-hearted priest in this parable is not necessarily included as an indictment of the priesthood in general. It was quite true that many of the priests and other religious leaders in Jesus' time lacked compassion, but that is not the point here. This priest represents anyone with full knowledge of the Scriptures and a familiarity with the duties of the law who is expected to help, but he does not. The next verse introduces a Levite. All priests were, of course, from the tribe of Levi. More specifically, those who served as priests were descendants of Aaron, one of the sons of Levi. The term Levite, therefore, referred to descendants of Levi who were not also descended from Aaron. They served in subordinate roles in the temple. 
Some were assistants to the priests. Some were temple police. Others worked in various behind-the-scenes roles, maintaining and servicing the temple grounds. But their lives were devoted to religious service. So they were, like the priests, expected to have a good knowledge of the Hebrew Scriptures. Nevertheless, when this Levite came to the place where the wounded man lay, he did the same thing the priest had done. As soon as he saw the helpless victim lying there, he moved to the opposite side of the road. Here was another man, devoid of compassion and bereft of loving kindness. Earlier in Luke chapter 10, Jesus had prayed, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. Verse 21. These two religious characters in the parable, a priest and a Levite, embodied what Jesus meant by the wise and prudent. They represented their culture's best educated and most highly esteemed religious dignitaries, but they did not really know God. Neither was truly fit for heaven. They were sons of disobedience, and therefore objects of God's wrath. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, chapter 5, verse 6, and Colossians chapter 3, verse 6. They didn't truly love God, because if you love God, you keep His commandments. They also didn't love their neighbors, because when they faced a real and urgent need and had an opportunity to demonstrate love, they refused. They are striking illustrations of religious hypocrites, observing the ceremonial law and even devoting their lives to the service of the temple, but lacking any real virtue. People sometimes cite the story of the Good Samaritan, point to the priest and Levite as examples of utter inhumanity, and then close the book with a sense of moral superiority. To do that is to miss Jesus' point. It's right, of course, to condemn the callous disregard of these two men and look upon their deliberate heedlessness with utter scorn. But in doing so, we condemn ourselves as well. Their attitude is precisely what we see in human nature today, even within our own hearts. We think, I don't want to get involved. I don't know what this man or the people who beat him up might do to me. Without in any way justifying the cold-hearted apathy Jesus was condemning, we must confess that we, too, are guilty of similar blind indifference, wretched insensitivity, and careless disregard of people in dire need. Even if we don't turn away every time we see someone in need, we all fail in this duty, enough to stand guilty before the law with its demand for utter perfection. Jesus makes that point unmistakable by introducing us to the Good Samaritan. Jews and Samaritans The Samaritan comes as an unexpected twist in Jesus' story. Like the man who was beaten and robbed, the Samaritan was on a journey alone. Sometime after the priest and Levite had passed by, the Samaritan arrived on the scene. Unlike those two professional clergymen, the Samaritan had compassion when he saw the bloodied body of the poor traveler. Luke chapter 10, verse 33. The robbery victim was a Jewish man. That would be perfectly clear to Jesus' listeners, because the setting of the story is in Israel, on a desert road heading out of Jerusalem. Gentiles rarely traveled there, much less Samaritans. In the minds of Jesus' original audience, a Samaritan would be the least likely source of help for a Jewish traveler in distress on the Jericho Road. For one thing, Samaritans assiduously avoided that road. A Samaritan would travel there only if there was a dire emergency forcing him to do so. But more than that, Jews despised Samaritans and vice versa. An acrimonious mutual hostility had divided the two peoples for centuries. Jewish travelers going to Galilee took the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, precisely because they wanted to avoid Samaria. People on that road were not headed straight north in the direction of Galilee, but east to Perea, on the other side of the Jordan River. 
It was an indirect route to Galilee, longer and more arduous, but it bypassed Samaria. Jewish people considered the Samaritans ethnically and religiously unclean, and the Samaritans likewise resented and despised their Jewish cousins. The Samaritans were descendants of Israelites who had intermarried with pagans after the Assyrians forced most of the population of Israel's northern kingdom into exile in 722 B.C. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 6. When the Assyrians conquered Israel's northern kingdom, they carried away much of the population into captivity, and they purposely populated the land with expatriate pagans from other Gentile lands. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and from Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its cities. And it was so, at the beginning of their dwelling there, that they did not fear the Lord. Verses 24 through 25. Some Israelite stragglers remained or returned to the land after most of their brethren were forced into exile. And these scattered Israelites mixed with and married the pagan settlers. They kept some traditions that were rooted in Old Testament doctrine, but they also blended enough pagan beliefs into the mix that Samaritan worship ultimately became something fundamentally different from either Judaism or paganism. It was a mongrel religion, the Old Testament equivalent of today's quasi-Christian cults. Of course, faithful Jews saw Samaritanism as corrupt, unclean, and treasonous to the God of Scripture. During the time of Ezra, Jews from the southern kingdom began to return from the Babylonian captivity. As they began to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, the Samaritans offered help. Unable to hide their religious contempt for Samaritan syncretism, the Jews refused. So the Samaritans tried to sabotage the project. Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Then a few years later, at the instigation of Sanballat, they also tried to halt the rebuilding of Jerusalem's wall. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 2. From that era and for centuries afterward, Jews and Samaritans had remained the bitterest of enemies. Jewish people regarded the Samaritans as apostate people who had sold their spiritual birthright. After all, the Samaritans had actively participated in the defilement of the land, they had polluted the bloodline, and they were guilty of idolatry. As far as the Jews were concerned, the Samaritans' very existence was evil fruit that stemmed from the sins of Jeroboam. 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 16, and 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 22. Like Jeroboam, the Samaritans ultimately built a temple of their own, with counterfeit priests and unlawful sacrifices. By the Jews' reckoning, they were worse than rank pagans because of the subtlety with which they had polluted their religion. The Samaritans' hatred for the Jews was at least equal to that. About 130 years before the time of Christ, John Hyrcanus, a Jewish king in the Hasmonean Maccabean dynasty, defeated the Samaritan nation. The Jews demolished the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim. And although that temple was never rebuilt, the Samaritans insisted that Gerizim was the only legitimate place of worship. John chapter 4, verse 20. Today there are fewer than a thousand Samaritans, but they still worship on Gerizim. In Jesus' time, animosity between Jews and Samaritans was especially fierce. The depth of the Jews' contempt for their wayward cousins is seen not only in how they avoided traveling through Samaria, but perhaps even more in how they spoke about the Samaritans. At one point, some exasperated Jewish leaders, losing a public debate with Jesus, but trying desperately to discredit him, spat out the worst insult they could imagine. Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? John chapter 8, verse 48. So here is a Samaritan man 
whom the typical Jewish religious leader would assume as the blood enemy of the injured traveler. If the priest and Levi turn their backs, what will this Samaritan do when he sees a helpless Jew out in the middle of nowhere? Kill him and rob his corpse? Not at all. When he saw him, he had compassion. Luke chapter 10, verse 33. What was Jesus trying to say? It was a preliminary answer to the original question. And it was a tough reply with a subtle rebuke aimed at the lawyer who raised the question in the first place. Elite status as religious leaders did nothing to make the priest and Levite fit for the kingdom. Pure and undefiled religion before God does not consist in birthrights and bloodlines or rituals and rote confessions of faith. Compare James chapter 1 verse 27. Pure religion is something else entirely. How the Samaritan Loved The Samaritan now takes center stage in the story. And here comes the main point. Notice how this man loves. He saw him. Luke chapter 10 verse 33. Nothing remarkable there. The priest and the Levite got that far. But they showed no love. This man, a heretic and outcast, was moved by compassion. Something in his heart went out to the man, a sense of sadness, grief, tender-hearted empathy. He saw and embraced the urgent need to rescue and recover the man. He bore the injured man's burden, as if it were his own. So he went to him, verse 34. That's the polar opposite of what the priest and Levite did. He bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Remember that everything of value had been taken from the injured man. So whatever the Samaritan used for bandages came out of his own bag or from his own clothes. The wine was antiseptic, and the oil was a balm and an anodyne. This would both sanitize and seal wounds in a way that would help prevent infection. The oil would also moisturize, soothe, and soften the tissue. Olive oil was the chief emollient used in the medicine of that time, and it was effective for bringing quick relief from the stinging pain of abrasions and bleeding wounds. Where did the oil and wine come from? Travelers on a long journey would carry oil for cooking and wine for drinking. Water along the way wasn't safe. The Samaritan was using his own provisions. The expression used tells us that he was not stingy with the wine and oil. He wasn't using an eyedropper or dabbing at the injured places. He washed the man's wounds thoroughly. Jesus is purposely stressing the lavishness of the Samaritan's generosity. Then Jesus says, He set him on his own animal, probably a donkey or a mule. Verse 34. It's the Samaritan's own animal. So the Samaritan walks with the injured man riding. What Jesus aims to underscore here is that this is not minimal care. The Samaritan was making an extraordinary sacrifice for someone he didn't even know. He brought him to an inn and took care of him. Verse 34. He didn't leave him alone there. The Samaritan stayed with the wounded traveler. He acquired a room, got the man settled, and then stayed with him to help nurse him back to health. He continued to treat his wounds, providing food, sleep, comfort, water, and whatever care the injured man needed. He stayed with him through the night because verse 35 says, On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Two denarii constituted two full days' wages, and from what we know of the rates at the time, that was enough for two months' room and board in a wayside inn like that. Again, this was remarkable charity, especially considering the men were strangers to one another and would have been deemed by most as enemies. Yet the Samaritan gave up his own clothes, his supplies, his time, a night's sleep, and a significant sum of cash. He even promised to pay more if necessary.
Someone might scold him for naively exposing himself to the possibility of being taken advantage of. But he was more concerned about the needs of his neighbor, so he left an open account on behalf of the wounded man. The Samaritan had never met the other man. He didn't know how the traveler got in the condition he found him in. And in Jesus' telling of the story, he didn't even stop to investigate or subject the man to any kind of cross-examination. His heart was so full of love that when someone came across his path with a desperate need he was able to meet, he did everything he could possibly do. There was never a question or hesitation. In other words, the Samaritan never stopped to ask what the lawyer had asked. And who is my neighbor? The far more important question is, Whose neighbor am I? And the answer is anyone in need. But let's be honest with ourselves. If we encountered a scenario like this in real life, most of us would probably think the Samaritan's generosity toward a stranger seems excessive. Did you ever set aside everything to help a total stranger in a desperate situation? More to the point, have you ever done that for someone who is your enemy? Did you risk defilement in order to minister to all his needs? Did you single-handedly provide everything he needed, dress his wounds, feed him, stay with him through a long night of pain, pay his bills, provide him with several weeks' room, board, and medical care, and then leave him with a blank check to pay everything he might need in the meantime? No? Limitless Love Actually, there is someone you've done all those things for. Yourself. That is precisely how we look after our own needs, isn't it? Give me whatever I need. Call the best doctor. Get me to the best medical facility. Arrange the best care I can get. Take care of me as long as I need it. Pamper me. Don't skimp on the amenities. We might get closest to true self-sacrifice with a family member or a very close friend. But who would do this for a stranger and an enemy to boot? This kind of thing is simply not done. No doubt you have done something wonderfully generous at some point in your life, but do you truly love strangers like this all the time? Of course not. Jesus is describing a rare love that has no limits. Keep in mind that this is also a sort of backhanded reply to the lawyer's original question in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? The answer goes like this. What does the law say? Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 27. You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Verse 28. Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan in order to show what an impossibly high standard the law sets for us. And it is a rebuke not just to the lawyer, but to all of us. If we always truly loved our neighbors the way we love and care for ourselves, the Samaritan's generosity would not seem so remarkable. Whatever polemical trap the lawyer was planning to lay for Jesus was defeated by the parable. At the end of the story, Jesus turned the lawyer's own question right back to him. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Verse 36. With the powerful lesson of that parable still hanging in the air, the lawyer had only one possible reply. He who showed mercy on him. Verse 37. Jesus' next reply ought to have provoked deep conviction and a humble confession of the man's own inability. Go and do likewise. Verse 37. Because here's the catch. The law demands that you love like that all the time. As a lawyer, the man should have known that he couldn't perform a single act of extravagant altruism and imagine that he had fulfilled the demands of the law forever. The law demands perfection all the time. Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26. Whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. James chapter 2 verse 10.
So Jesus' final reply to the man, go and do likewise, should have moved the lawyer to plead for grace and forgiveness. If that is what the law means when it promises life to those who obey, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5, we have no hope at all under the law. The only thing the law can do for us is doom us. The commandment, which was to bring life, is thus instead found to bring death. Romans chapter 7, verse 10. Because the law demands absolute and utter godlike perfection, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, no one who has ever sinned can be fit for eternal life on the law's terms. That's what the lawyer should have realized. So should we. The full truth is that even Christians into whose hearts the law of God has been poured out, Romans chapter 5, verse 5, do not consistently love like the law demands. But there's a deeper lesson here. The way the Good Samaritan cared for the traveler is the way God loves sinners. In fact, God's love is infinitely more profound and more amazing than that. The Samaritan sacrificed his time and money to care for a wounded enemy. God gave his own eternal son to die for sinners who deserve nothing more than eternal damnation. When we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man. Someone would even dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Indeed, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son. Verse 10. What Christ did to redeem his people far exceeds the lavish act of benevolence pictured in the parable. Christ is the living embodiment of divine love in all its perfection. He is spotless, sinless, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. During his earthly life, he did literally fulfill every jot and tittle of the law to absolute perfection. And then in dying, he even bore the penalty of sin for others. Moreover, his unblemished righteousness, including the full merit of that perfect love, is imputed to those who trust him as Lord and Savior. Their sins are forgiven, and they are clothed in the perfect righteousness the law requires. They inherit eternal life, not as a reward for their own good works, but purely by grace, because of Christ's work on their behalf. If that lawyer had only confessed his own guilt and admitted his inability to do what the law demands, Jesus would have been ready to offer him an eternity of mercy, grace, forgiveness, and true love. If he had simply sensed his need, the straightforward, plain language answer to his question was already on the lips of Jesus, who repeatedly said things like, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. John chapter 5, verse 24. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Chapter 3, verse 36. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Chapter 10, verses 27 through 28. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Chapter 11, verse 26. Jesus never made such a promise to smug and self-righteous souls. Both this man and the rich young ruler asked him specific questions about how to inherit eternal life, and he answered by confronting them with the law's demands. But for those with ears to hear, he constantly made it perfectly clear that eternal life is not earned through legal merit. Rather, it is the gracious inheritance of all who truly put their faith in Christ as Lord and Savior. Did the man embrace the lesson Jesus was teaching him? Did he confess his inability when Jesus told him, Go and do likewise? Did he acknowledge his need for grace and repent? Apparently not. That is the end of the story.
Luke turns immediately to a different incident from the ministry of Jesus. Publicly disgraced in his failed attempt to win a verbal sparring match with Jesus, the anonymous lawyer simply disappears from the narrative, and we never hear about him again. Like the typical proud, self-sufficient religious person, he might have made a resolution to double down on doing good works in order to prove himself worthy of divine favor and eternal life. Such people are oblivious to, or else they refuse to believe, what the righteousness of God really demands of them. They seek to establish their own righteousness without submitting to the righteousness God has revealed in Christ. Compare Romans chapter 10, verse 3. They read the parable of the Good Samaritan as if it were nothing more than a mandate for humanitarianism. It's fine to be motivated by the parable to perfect our love for our neighbors. I hope you are motivated that way. But if that is your only response to this parable, it is practically the worst response anyone could have to the lesson Jesus was teaching. This parable is meant to constrain us to confess our sinful weakness, revealed in our lack of compassionate, sacrificial love, and seek grace and mercy by turning with repentant faith to Jesus Christ, the only one who truly and perfectly fulfilled what the law demands of us. He alone is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. He is the only true source of eternal life. If that lawyer had truly looked into the law of God, as he himself recited the commandments, and recognized his sin rather than turning away, and immediately forgetting what kind of man he was, James chapter 1, verse 24, he would have found a Savior whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. But as we see, the story ends without a hint of his repentance. That must not be our response to this parable. Chapter 6. A Lesson About Justification by Faith The kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. The Pharisees of Jesus' time were the strictest and most influential religious sect in all of Israel. The New Testament does not paint them in a positive light. One of the key moments in the ministry of John the Baptist was his shocking rebuke of some Pharisees who came to be baptized. John refused them, saying, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 8, and Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 8. Not long after that, John the Baptist singled out Jesus as the true Lamb of God. John chapter 1, verses 29 through 30. And as you might expect, John's endorsement immediately put Jesus on the wrong side of the Pharisees. As soon as it became clear that Jesus was gaining an even larger following than John, the Pharisees opposed him. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, they were his most vocal and relentless opponents. Leading Pharisees were the ones who ultimately initiated and masterminded the conspiracy to put him to death. John chapter 11, verses 46 through 53. The Pharisees' contempt for Christ continued even after his resurrection, especially while the early church was beginning to take root. In Acts chapter 7, verses 58 through chapter 8, verse 1, we are told that Saul of Tarsus oversaw the stoning of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. Acts chapter 26, verse 10, suggests that Stephen's stoning was only the start of a brutal campaign of terror Saul waged against believers. Saul was a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, Acts chapter 23, verse 6.
In other words, he came from a line of Pharisees and was trained from birth in the doctrines of Phariseeism, striving to observe Moses' law all his life. He was the ideal Pharisee, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Thus born and bred into Phariseeism, Saul became a leading figure in the sect while he was still a very young man. He was personally appointed by the chief priests to harass and imprison early Christians for their faith. Whenever followers of Jesus were on trial for their lives before the Jewish ruling council, Saul cast his vote in favor of stoning. Acts chapter 26, verse 10. The fact that he had a vote in the matter suggests that Saul himself was at that time a member of the Sanhedrin. He had reached the pinnacle of influence in the sect and devotion to its teachings. His unusual zeal for Phariseeism was clearly reflected in his hatred of Christianity. All of that, of course, preceded his famous encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. When Saul of Tarsus was instantly and utterly transformed into the Apostle Paul, giving his testimony years later, Paul said he counted all his efforts to be righteous, as a Pharisee, nothing but rubbish. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. The King James Version translates the word more literally and more vividly as dung. That was Paul's candid assessment of Phariseeism, writing as a seasoned saint and mature apostle. From beginning to end, the New Testament makes it clear that Phariseeism and Christianity don't mix. Indeed, certain core principles of the Pharisees' religion and worldview are hostile to the fundamental message of the gospel. That is not to suggest that Phariseeism is the most extreme possible perversion of religion. Far from it. The Pharisees taught much that was true, because their beliefs were closely tied to Scripture. Jesus himself said of them, Whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. Matthew chapter 23, verse 3. Unlike so many cults and false religions that are grossly unorthodox, overtly diabolical, or blithely indifferent to the law of God, the Pharisees were traditionalists and idealists well known for their punctilious obsession with the smallest details of the law. Phariseeism is singled out in the New Testament, not because it was some far-fetched brand of extreme human superstition, but because it represents the most slight and subtle departure from biblical truth. The spiritual dangers embodied in Phariseeism can be a temptation and a snare even to the most devoted student of Scripture. Why was this particular brand of Judaism so deadly? After all, the Pharisees gave every appearance of being champions of righteousness. In fact, external appearances were what concerned them the most. Their idea of righteousness was mostly cosmetic. They excelled at hiding their own unrighteousness and papering over their secret sins with works of religion, while they declaimed passionately against the more visible sins of others. Far from being careless with respect to the law, they made a great show of obeying the law's fine points in an exaggerated, ostentatious way. Matthew chapter 23, verse 5. Their use of the law is a cloak for their sin, therefore turn the whole purpose of the law on its head. Whereas the law is supposed to reveal sin and show its exceeding sinfulness, they use the law to disguise what was really in their hearts. And they salve their own guilt by self-righteously comparing themselves with others. The subtlety of their error obscured by the pretense that they were strongly committed to the law of God, is what made their brand of religion so dangerous. Nevertheless, the Pharisees were indeed rigorous students of the biblical text. Quite a few noble and praiseworthy elements stand out in their beliefs and teachings. For example, they opposed all pagan forms of idolatry and were determined 
not to allow their nation to fall into the kind of compromise and backsliding that colored the history of Old Testament Israel. They were in many ways the very best of all the first century sects of Judaism. Specifically, the Pharisees were less mystical and more committed to practicing their faith in the real world than the Essenes, ascetics who lived in communal groups. They were much more doctrinally sound than the Sadducees, who were skeptical about everything supernatural. Matthew chapter 22, verse 23, and Acts chapter 23, verse 8. They did not produce political extremists, ruffians, outlaws, and even wanton murderers the way the party of the zealots did. By contrast, the Pharisees were so meticulous in their compliance with legal minutia that they would carefully strain any drink while pouring it to make sure no gnat had gotten into the wine while it was aerating. Gnats are insects, and therefore ceremonial defiling. They would painstakingly count tiny seeds in order to make sure their tithe was accurate. Luke chapter 11, verse 42. After all, Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 says, Every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Jesus did not chide them for their over-particular obsession with seed counts, gnat straining, and other trifling observances. Rather, Jesus said, These you ought to have done, but without leaving the law's larger moral principles undone. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Despite all their attention to the law's external details, they were utterly oblivious to the law's central message. The law ought to have humbled them by showing them the magnitude of their guilt. Instead, it became a point of extreme pride for them. Jesus called the Pharisees blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Verse 24. Gnats, of course, are the tiniest unclean creatures described in Moses' law. Camels are the largest. Jesus' word picture makes a humorous mental image but his point was totally serious. All their exacting efforts to keep up appearances had not diminished their guilt in the smallest measure, much less had it curtailed the expression of sin in their own hearts. He told them, You are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautifully outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 through 28. They were guilty sinners. They were as lost, depraved, and spiritually blind as the outcasts and unclean people whom they treated with extreme contempt. Although their well-honed legalism obscured their wickedness from human eyes, it did not fool God. The Pharisees' hypocrisy was itself a damnable sin.